Okay. All right. Almost good afternoon. We are uh, beginning the third session. Um, it wasn't intended as a two-part series, as uh, Rabbi Foreman's was, but it is actually, I think, um, two complementary shiurim. In the first shiur, we, we tried to uh, find within Echa uh, some consolation and some way of uh, coping with the, the present situation by utilizing the past, by looking towards the future, and by looking deep inward and seeing if we could find the internal strength to cope with the situation, even perhaps to find some something positive that we can find within the situation. Now, what I want to do right now is is to see what the what Chazal did with um, with the book of Echa, and particularly to look at the book of Echa Rabbah, which is the book of Midrash that Chazal wrote that was interpreting uh, Megillat Echa. Um, but I want to start. I want to begin by saying that you know this is a very early book of Midrash. Um, we know that we have ten Midrashe Rabbah, right? The five Midrashe Rabbah on Chumash, the five Midrashe Rabbah, Rabbah on the on the Megillot, right? But they're not all written by the same person. They're not all written in the same time, and they're not all written in the same language, right? And they, they're compilations, clearly, of many different Batei Midrash, many different interpretive efforts, um, but some of the Midrashim are compiled very late and some are very early. I say this because Echa Rabbah is one of the earliest Midrashe Rabbah to be completed and closed. Okay, the earliest uh, we believe is, and you, know, you can only really approximate, uh, the earliest is Breshit Rabbah, but the second earliest is Echa Rabbah. And that's, that's important for our purposes because what I want to claim is, is that Echa Rabbah is a very important book for Chazal. It's an important book for Chazal because Chazal are dealing with their own Chorban, right? They need the book of Echa, right? We have twice the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. So Echa is written as a response to the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash in 586 BCE by the Babylonians. But Echa Rabbah is written in order to provide the community with tools for coping with the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash, which happened in 70 CE by the Romans, right? So Chazal are, are writing not necessarily in 70 CE, but in the years that follow. And the book of Echa Rabbah, the, this book of Midrash, essentially is completed uh, around 350 years later, something around that, right? 300 years later. And it is a compilation of the rabbinic attempt to try to cope with the tragedy, okay? And they, of course, are using Echa as a means to try to extract meaning, consolation, advice, rehabilitation for the community that is dealing with the tragedy of their own. Now, there's little doubt that when Chazal are reading the book of Echa, they're sort of blurring between the original destruction and their own destruction. You have it really all over the book of Echa Rabbah. I'll just give you one example, which I didn't bring for you on the source sheets, which is on the words in the very beginning of Echa, Bacho tivke valayla v'dimata al echeya, right? She surely cries in the night. Her tears are left on her cheeks. So the Midrash asks, Shtei b'chiyot lamali, right? Why do I need Bacho tivke? It's just enough, right? Tivke balayla, right? We don't need that dual language. So Chazal say, Echad al hamikdash harishon, Right? The first word that describes the cries are for the first Beit HaMikdash. The second are for the, is for the second Beit HaMikdash. Of course, this is Chazal's way of saying that the book of Echa is just as much about their own contemporary events as it is about the events in 586 BCE, which is, of course, the way that we read Echa until today, right? We interpret Echa as not just being a specific event in a specific time, but of course it relates to all of Am Yisrael's experiences with destruction, with despair, with exile, with persecutions, etc. But specifically when it comes to uh, the book of Echa Rabbah, which I, I want to I spend uh, today's shiur trying to understand, we have to understand that this is a very personal book for Chazal, right? That they're using the book of Echa in order to provide whatever it is that they think that their community needs. Now, in general, I would say, uh, you know, rabbinic literature is very interested 
in giving the community tools to cope with destruction. Right? They're very interested in this. It's very important for them. Obviously, this is one of the great challenges of Chazal, not just talking about the destruction of 70 CE. Of course, uh, 62 years later, we have the Bar Kokhva revolt, which is, it ends with terrible devastation in 135. So they're dealing with that and the fallout from that and the communities that are wandering around. And Chazal have to provide some kind of messages and tools for the community to survive in the aftermath of these events. Um, now, in general, I would say that rabbinic sources are interested in providing these tools, not just in Echar So if you look through the Gemara, you'll see lots of different discussions that seem to revolve around the question of how do we pick up from here, right? So for example, very famously, the Takanot of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, right, which is all about normalization after losing the Mikdash, right? So, you know, you have all these, uh, you know, it used to be we did such and such and such and such in the Mikdash. Mi shecharav beit HaMikdash hitkin Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, etc., etc., right? Since the Beit HaMikdash has been destroyed, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai made a takana that was meant to recall our service in the Mikdash, but allow us to continue along a path of normal, kind of avoda and daily service and relationship with God, even though we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. I think everybody would recognize that that is a coping mechanism. It's a spiritual coping mechanism for dealing with the loss of the Beit HaMikdash, right? You're gonna find those kinds of things scattered throughout uh, rabbinic literature. There are other uh, paths that we find in Tanakh. So for example, there's a uh, well-known Mishnah at the end of Masechet Sota, I also didn't bring you that, but the Mishnah basically is bemoaning the situation and saying, Mi Shecharav Beit HaMikdash, from the time that the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, terrible things happen, there's terrible violence, there's terrible despair, everybody is covering their heads in shame, ve'ein doresh, ve'ein mivakesh, ve'ein sho'el, right? There's nothing to do, there's no one to turn to. Al mi lanu li sha'ein, Right? It's also a coping mechanism, right? We have nothing left to do. We have no one to rely on. We have no one to turn to. What can we do? Emuna pshuta. Right? You just have to rely on God. That's also a response to a situation which the people are dealing with, right? There are other responses that sort of arise in some of the rabbinic sources that are rejected by Chazal. So there's a Gemara in Bavatra where the people, uh, after the Beit HaMikdash is destroyed, they say, we're done. We're done with this world. We're not going to eat any more bread. We're not going to drink any more wine. We're not going to have any more joy. And the Gemara rejects that, right? They say, no, no, no. You have to keep going, which is another. Again, it's an attempt to try to cope with people who want to remove themselves from this world. It's a cruel world. It's a frightening world. It's a world which has ceased to function in order to provide joy for the community. The community says, we want to become ascetics, right? And the Gemara says, that's not okay, right? That's not okay. So all of these different Gemaras, I think, all of these different rabbinic sources <coughs> are showing us that Chazal are really very interested in developing approaches for the community after the Chorban. Some approaches they encourage, others they discourage, right? I think perhaps we can't uh, end this discussion, this sort of general schematic uh, uh, description of the way that Chazal deal with Chorban without mentioning Messianism, right? Which is, of course, you know, Rabbi Akiva, who is supporting the Bar Kokhva revolt. One way to cope with the destruction is to look towards the immediacy of redemption, right? And we have both pro-Messianic rabbinic sources and anti-Messianic rabbinic sources, right? So we have some rabbinic sources which say, you know, that's nice, but you know, you can't rely on that. You can't base your faith on that. You know, the Mashiach will come when he comes and you just keep, keep living life, you know, keep trying to find a healthy and viable community of serving God, even when you're no longer in Yerushalayim, even when you've lost national autonomy. So Chazal are really rather vigorously discussing how to approach the Chorban, and there are many different approaches which emerge. But what I want to talk about today is specifically Echa Rabbah, and particularly the way in which Echa Rabbah meets Echa, right? Because of course, ostensibly, Echa Rabbah is a book which is interpreting the book of Echa, right? Well, one of the things that we saw 
in the first class, and here maybe I'm going to give a little bit of a different perspective than the one that I gave in the first class, is that Echa is really insufficient in terms of providing consolation. I know, I know this morning I said, you can mine it for all of its, you know, linguistic illusions, et cetera, et cetera. But when you open the book, you see what I said you see, which is no consolation, right? No nechama, no real well-developed explanation, right? Unless you're, you know, finding all those linguistic illusions, a terrible description of suffering, no rehabilitation, no real guidelines for repairing the situation, lots of enemies that are jeering and cheering and succeeding and prospering, right? And a very demoralizing portrait of God. God is very distant in the book. At, at, at best, he is, he, he is uh, you know, uh, punishing. At worst, he becomes an enemy, right? I mean, these are really, this is really a demoralizing portrait. And um, it's not an easy book to mine it and to interpret it and to offer positive messages from it. So I, I want to begin really with two questions. One is, how, does, how do Chazal have the means to extract from Echa a positive message, given, first of all, that they're dealing with their own korban, right? So that, you know, I read the book of Echa and I understand perfectly well why there's no nechama, because they're walking through the streets and looking at horrid, dreadful sights of children dying. So they're not writing positive messages of consolation, right? So then how can Chazal be writing positive messages of consolation? That's one question. And the other question is, is why they need the book of Echa at all, right? So, so give your messages of consolation, write a nice, uh, I don't know, a nice uh, a monograph um, that is, you know, Pirkei Nechama by Chazal, right? Why, 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 why interpret the book of Echa um, in order to provide consolation when in fact it seems to, and we're going to see, really reverse Echa on its head. Okay, so in terms of the, uh, the first question that I asked, uh, and that is, you know, how do Chazal have the means and the strength to offer consolation when the book of Echa doesn't, I think that a partial answer to this uh, appears in Echa Rabba itself. So look in the first source that I brought for you. I think it's, it's a very astute midrash. It gives us a bit of a, of a, of a sort of a, a, almost a psychological explanation as to the difference between <clears throat> Echa the book and Echa Rabba, which really in, 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 uh, should be very similar books. So the midrash tells us as follows. Rabbi Yochanan havadarashitin apin bebila Hashem velo chamal. Okay, so Rabbi Yochanan would explain the words, would explain the Pasuk, Bila Hashem Belo Chamal, God consumed and he did not pity Yerushalayim, right? Um, in, in, Rabbi Yochanan would explain this verse in 60 ways. The Rebbe have a darish esrim va'arba'a apim. But Rebbe, Rabbi Yudan Anasi, could only give 24 explanations of that Pasuk. So the, the, the Midrash is surprised. Vilad Rabbi Yochanan, Yatir al Rebbe? Is it possible that Rabbi Yochanan is greater than Rebbe? He could come up with 60 interpretations and, and Rebbe could only come up with 24? Obviously not. Ella Rebbe, al Yedei Shaya Samuch le Chorban. Rebbe lived closer in time to the Chorban. Haya Nizkar, he would remember the events. The Haya Doresh u Boche u Mitnachem. Right? Rebbe was emotionally deeply mired in the story of Chorban. And so he would start explaining the Pasuk and he would begin to cry and he would have to console himself and only then could he begin again, right? I think that the point of this Midrash <clears throat> is a very powerful point. The Midrash has explained to us that as we get further and further from the event, we can become more and more objective about the event. We get distance, right? Time heals. How many books about the Holocaust were written in 1950? Not that many, right? Maybe none, right? It took some time before people could take a step back and begin to contemplate and begin to think about the events with a certain amount of distance. Echa is written as an eyewitness description, certainly the first four chapters, okay? And there is no real ability to take a step out. Whereas the Midrash is composed over the course of several hundred years. And as we move farther and farther away, there's a better and a better sense of what the people need and what it is that Chazal are able to give them, okay? Now, one of my goals in this class is really, I think, to give you an appreciation for Chazal, 
particularly for the book of Echaraba, but also for Chazal's role as not just teachers, but also compassionate um, uh, leaders of the generation. Right? They're trying to provide their community with the means to rehabilitate, with the means to reconstitute themselves. And this really does lead me to my next point, which is, you know, why, does, uh, why, does, uh, uh, why do Chazal need Echa at all? Right? And, and we're going to see in a moment, and this I think is really, maybe, maybe we'll start with, with seeing this, what I think is really sort of almost uh, uh, astounding is that in order to accomplish their goals, Sometimes, and I would even say quite often, Chazal in Echa Rabbah reversed the meaning of the Pasuk. Right? They have a lot of creative license, Chazal. I, mean, I, I assume you've seen this before. Chazal oftentimes will read a Pasuk and say, okay, it says that, but what it really means is the very opposite. You see that a lot in Echa Rabbah. I'm going to show you just two examples, but I think that they're really powerful examples. Look at source number two. <clears throat> These are on the words, Eila Menachem. And we, I already said, you know, that's the phrase that appears five times in Perak Aleph. Elam Menachem, she has no comforter. Look at what Rabbi Levi says. Amar Rabbi Levi, kol makom shenemar en havala. Anywhere where it says that there isn't something, and then there is. And then they bring some wonderful examples. Bati Sarai Akara, en lavlad. The Havala, right? In the beginning, she has no child, but eventually she does. Hashem Pagazar. Ud and very similarly, ulechana. Ain Yeladim. The Havala, right? In the beginning, she has none, then she has. Kifakar Hashem et Chana, Dechavate, Tzion hi, Doresh Einla, right? Tzion has no one that seeks it. The Havala, but she will, because it says, Uval et Tzion, Goel, right? A redeemer will come to Tzion. And here as well, says Rabbi Levi, Afkan, Ata Omer, Einla Menachim, the Havala, but there is Shenemar, and this is a pasuk that we read in the first class. Anochi, Anochi, who Menachem Chem, right? I will be your comforter, says God, right? So again, there's this, uh, there's a sense that Chazal have the creative license and the will, right, and the desire to take a pasuk that says she has no comforter, turn it on its head, and say. You know, well, if it says she has none, so clearly that means that there will be, right? Because we see it in other places. And they use, I think, some very uh, creative tools at their disposal, ones that we use quite a lot today, right? The tools of comparing. And they take all these psukim that say ain and that seem to be hopeless, many of which are psukim that are related to childbearing, right? This sense that there is no future, right? And here they provide in the end, a child. So Yerushalayim also has lost its future. Betulotai, vachurai, halchu, vashevi, my sons, my daughters. They've been taken off into captivity. And the Midrash says, well, <clears throat> therefore, uh, we, we, we must assume that eventually everything will be restored because of the language. Right? We see this in other places as well. Look, for example, in source number three. This will be the only other source where, which I'll bring to you. But th- we have other places where in Echa Rabah where a similar kind of mechanism is used. The Pasuk tells us in Perakei, Avadi Mashluvanu, right? Uh, servants ruled us. Elu Mitzrayim, Elu Mitzrayim, these are the Egyptians. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Il, yeah, Elu, Elu Mitzrayim. Porek ein mi adam. We have no redeemer from their hands. Look what the, the Midrash goes on and says. Ilu Moshe, right? Except we did, right? right that, that, it's talking about Egypt, and it seemed like we had no redeemer. Here, this relates to Rabbi Foreman's uh, uh, shear, right? Ilu Moshe, but eventually Moshe comes along, right? It goes on. Avadim mashlu vanu. Elu Arba Malchuyot. This is talking about the period of the other, uh, uh, the, the, the kings that are going to rule us. Porek ain mi adam, when it says there is no one who can redeem us. Ilulei hakadosh barachu. There is someone who can redeem us. Okay, so the Pasuk says, Avadi mashluvanu, porek ain mi adam. Servants ruled us. There's no one to liberate us from their hands. And the Midrash says, that was true about Mitzrayim until Moshe came along, and it's true about our period until God comes along. So again, it says, and the Midrash wants to say, 
oh, don't worry, that means pareh yesh mi adam, right? So again, it's a similar kind of attempt to take the psukim and sort of turn them on their head. And, and, and the question that I want to ask is, is why Chazal do this? So I think, first of all, it, it shows us a great deal of determination and desire on the part of Chazal, but why do they need the Megillah? And I think that the answer is, is because they are looking for Dvar Hashem. Chazal want to, to, to receive Dvar Hashem. It is a period when prophecy is no longer. And the best way to get Dvar Hashem is to make the text speak, okay? So they're going to extrapolate from Echa as many messages of consolation and rehabilitation and re- 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 reinstatement of the community as they can because it's important to them. So actually, sort of in a, in a, in a sort of ironic way, they're, the havoc that they wreak with the text presupposes their reverence for the text, right? How important Echa was to them. They need to make Echa talk, right? And they need to make it say messages to the people that the people need to hear. And that's part of what we're going to see <clears throat> throughout Echa Rabbah. So um, I want to basically talk about three different areas in which I think Echa Rabbah fills the void that is created by the book of Echa. I think that there is a psychological problem that the people are left with after Echa, a certain demor- uh, you know, a certain kind of demoralization, a certain kind of despair, which we also spoke about this morning. I think there is a theological problem that arises from our reading of Echa. And I think that there is a practical problem that Chazal had in Echa. Chazal want Echa to give uh, um, uh, psychological support, dignity to the people, the ability for the people to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, rebuild their community. And Chazal want to give theological messages from the book of Echa. And Chazal want to give practical advice to the people from Echa. And this is the way that they're going to compose Echa Rabbah with an eye towards accomplishing these things. So let's start with the psychological uh, area. Right? So I think that, that, that one thing, and some of these ideas I think are going to find some sort of correlation with some of the ideas that we said this morning. Um, so this morning I spoke a little bit about the fact that Echa uh, is engaged a little bit, not much, but a little bit in recollections of the past, right? I'm not talking about the linguistic illusions. I'm actually talking about the word Zachor, right? Zachra Yerushalayim Yemei Onya Umerudeha. Yerushalayim remembers during her days of pain it's called Machamuda, Asher Hayulam Yimei right? She remembers all those wonderful times. And I mentioned before, uh, this morning, that um, there are several places in Megillat Echa where Echa, in describing the terrible present state of the people, they compare it to what it used to be like. That's the very first Pasuk, right? Echa Yashva Vadad, Ha'ir Rabati Am. How this city sounds lo- sits lonely, but it was a city that was once filled with people. We have a similar kind of uh, comparison between the present and the past several times in Paragdalid. Echa yu am zahav, yishne haketem hatov. How has the gold become dimmed? That beautiful gold has changed its appearance. Tishtapechna avnei kodesh, birosh kol chutzot. All of those precious jewels are now spilled on the streets of the city. And later on in Perak Dalid, we're told, ha'ochlim lama'adanim, those who used to eat delicacies, nashamu bachutzot, they now die in the streets. Ha'emunim alei tola, chibaku ashpetot. Those who were raised in clothes of scarlet now have to hug the garbages in order to obtain warmth. So when I read Eicha as, you know, uh, uh, we're reading it for what it is, I understand that the purpose of these psukim is to, is to increase our sense of loss and, and despair, right? Not only are we in this terrible, wretched situation, but... Well, look where we were just a few years back. 
We were the top. We were the prince. We were the, 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 the heights of glory and prosperity and splendor. And look at what we've lost. Now, <clears throat> Chazal read this and they see the same thing, but they also see an opportunity. They see an opportunity to remind Am Yisrael what they once were. And when you look at Chazal's interpretation of these psukim, you're going to see something that is really wonderful. I mean, again, it's sort of, it, it's not exactly reversing the meaning, but it's focusing on only the half that is full, right? Because, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, wow, the loss is really felt. It's really, you know, poignant how much we've lost. And Chazal look at it and say, wait, remember what you were. You were, you were Rabbati Vagoyim, right? You were the greatest among all of the nations. And so they're going to spend a lot of time on these psukim describing the past splendor, the past riches, the past experience in your time. I'll give you one example outside, and then we'll see one example in the source sheets themselves. So the outside example is, you know, on those psukim echa, yuan zahav yishneh, Right, we have that description of the gold and the jewels. So uh, uh, Chazal spent a lot of time on a very wealthy woman in Yerushalayim uh, whose name is Miriam Bat Baitus, right? And they describe her wealth in great detail, right? There, there's, don't forget who she was. This was a woman that as her child grew, every single day she would take him to the Beit HaMikdash and put him on a scale and then donate his weight in gold, right? Those are the kinds of stories, I and mean, these are vivid stories. They're vibrant stories. And the attempt, again, is to give a sense of Yerushalayim, what it was. Take it with you. Don't forget it, right? That's an attempt to try to restore Am Yisrael's dignity. Okay, look at this Midrash. I think this is a great Midrash. Look at source number four. Okay, so we have this description. It's, you know, Pasuk Aleph. It's one of the Pasukim that people know best. We have a description of Ha'ir Abati Am. It's a city that is filled with people. So <clears throat> the obvious question is, how many people lived in Yerushalayim, right? That's what everybody wants to know. How many people lived in Yerushalayim before the Chorban? Tani Rabbi Shmuel. Esri v'arba paltiyot ha'yib Yerushalayim. There are 24 districts in Yerushalayim. The Chol paltiyot paltiyot esri v'arba mevo'ot. Each district had 24 sections. The Chol mavoy mavoy esri v'arba shvakim. And each section had 24 marketplaces. Now, kol shuk v'shuk esri v'arba shkakim. And each each marketplace had 24, I don't know, further subsections. And in each of these further subsections, they had 24 courtyards. There were 24 houses. Each courtyard had double the number of people who left Egypt. Anybody very good at math? <laughs> What's the number? How many people lived in little Yerushalayim before the destruction? Nine and a half trillion people. Okay? <laughs> Just a bit of exaggeration, right? But again, it's not that, right? It's, it, it, Chazal are, 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 are using their poetic license to give you a sense the vibrancy, the bustle, Yerushalayim. It felt like the center of the world. People coming in, people going out, merchandise and pilgrims and sacrifices, and you couldn't move in the streets of Yerushalayim. And that was what it felt like. And when you read this Midrash, you feel it. You feel it swirling around you. And I think that that's what Echa Rabah is accomplishing. You read through Echa Rabah and you really have a sense of the dignity of Am Yisrael. And Chazal are, are, this is very important, right? It's very important for Chazal because Am Yisrael is about to embark upon a very undignified future, right? The path that they are treading down is one that, as we've seen, is a demoralizing path. And one of Chazal's goals is to support their dignity, is to restore for them their dignity. Now, we have this in, 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 in several different contexts in the um, in 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 Echaraba, not just in in this particular comparison of the past to the present, I'll mention one more. It's it's fascinating, perhaps slightly disturbing, and that is that in uh, Perak Aleph of Echaraba, we have a series of stories in which Am Yisrael's cleverness and brains trumps the power, the brutality, and the riches of the enemy. <laughs> Right? It's a series of stories. They're fascinating stories. You read them, some of them even seem 
I don't know, a bit questionable. They're not ones that I would recommend. I mean, I would recommend to, to do, right? But, but the, the idea that emerges from it is something that I think is very important for Amistad all the time, which is, you know, they can take from you your houses and they can take from you your families and they can take from you your, uh, your, your autonomy and they can take for, from you your temple, but they can't take your brains. Right? They can't take your cleverness. Right? That goes with you wherever you go. That is something which Am Yisrael can take with themselves and it enables uh, Am Yisrael to survive cleverly throughout very difficult times. Now, I would tell you one of these stories, but I don't have so much time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that aside um, and you know, we'll leave that for another time. I would recommend, if anyone is really interested, to look in Echa Rabah, in Perak Aleph, starting around Yud, Yud Aleph, right? There's a whole series of stories there. And those stories, I think, suggest to us to what lengths Chazal are willing to go in order to restore to the people their dignity. I think that this is part, partially, I think that this is a, a, a way to perhaps gain appreciation for what Chazal are doing. They're not engaged in a dry, technical, intellectual endeavor of trying to interpret Megillat Echa. They are using their skills at interpretation to lead the people, to console them, to provide them with the dignity and the support that they need in order to uh, to build up their community. I think that's 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 magnificent. I think that's wonderful, and I think it's important to note that this is something that Chazal <clears throat> are doing. I want to turn our attention, though, to a second area in which, obviously, and it shouldn't surprise us at all, in which obviously uh, Chazal are, are are focused and and they're interested in, and that is the theological one. There is a huge, huge void. There is a huge problem when we are reading through the book of Echa when it comes to theology. And of course, it really starts with God, right? With God's role in the book, right? How does Echa open? How does it describe the city? Echa yashva vada da'ir abatiyam hayata ke'almana, right? This is a widowed city. Who was her husband? Who died, right? But, I mean, you could say maybe I'm Yisrael, that's, that's one reading. Seems to be God, right? right? She has been widowed of God. Now, Rashi says, you got to focus on the kaf, hadimayon, right? It's not that she's a widow, it's she's like a widow. But, of course, she's not really a widow because God will one day come back to her. Lo alman Yisrael, right? Yisrael can't really be widowed of God. Of course, we know that he's right, theologically. But I'm left with that word widow, Right? That's what resonates, that kind of emptiness of, of, of sensing throughout the book of Echa that God is not available, right? I mean, God never answers in the book of Echa. And what we hear over and over throughout the book is God's abandonment of the people. Penei Hashem chilkam lo yosif habitam. The face of God scattered them. And he no longer looked at them. Remember I said this morning that the most minimal request that comes up over and over and over is, Re'ei Hashem ve'abita. Look at me, God. See me. God has hidden his face. And this state of God's inaccessibility, this is a problem. It's a problem for us as we read Echa. It's a really big problem for Chazal. They can't leave Echa like that for their for their community, right? They need to provide uh, a, a different kind of uh, relationship with God, and they need to draw it from Migilat Echa. But I'll say one more thing. It's not just that Echa suggests that God has abandoned Am Yisrael, and that certainly for the present, he is absolutely not accessible, but that this depiction of God is coupled with a far more menacing portrait, right? It's much more frightening and it's much more disturbing. And that is that, I mentioned it before, it's not just that God punishes, it's that God is described as an enemy. This is an extraordinarily rare description. We only have it in one other place in Tanakh, right? This is not a, a, a usual description. This is not characteristic of the Tanakh. We have it several times. Darach kashto ke'oyev, right? 
he, he poised his, 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 uh, his bow like an enemy. Haya Adonai ke'oyev bila Yisrael. God was like an enemy. And not to mention all the descriptions of God punishing oti nahag vayolechoshech v'lo or right? He led me in darkness. Kila Hashem et chamato shafach haron apo. God poured his anger out against me, right? This description of God as an enemy is only really uh, corroborating the description of God pouring out his wrath on the people. Asher hoga Hashem biyom haron apo. Over and over and over, God is making the people moan on the day of his great anger. Um, it, the, 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 the depiction of God is very difficult. It's very distressing. And for Chazal, it's untenable. It's untenable. How can their community reconcile with God and reconstitute their community if by the time I finish, Migilat Echa, God's depiction remains at best that of abandonment, and at worst, that of hostile foe. This is really a very, very uh, problematic uh, portrait for Chazal, and therefore, again, we have a reversal of this depiction in Echarabah. Not that God is not punishing. God is absolutely punishing in Echarabah as well. But what we find throughout Echarabah is a very, very different picture of God, and that is that God is not the enemy, God is the primary victim, right? You're going to see that a lot in Echarabah. Some of, I think, the most poignant uh, midrashim are not depictions of Am Yisrael and their suffering, but depictions of God's suffering, okay? So look, for example, in source number uh, five. I, I think this is, this is a really moving one. Echarabah has, you know, um, uh, before Perak Aleph, it has 36 petich ta'ot, right? Which are sort of introductions that were, that were read before they began reading the book of Echa, presumably on Tisha B'Av. So this is Petichta number Kaf Dalet, number 24. God turned to his ministering angels and he said, Let's go, me and you, let's go see what's going on with my house. What do the enemies do to it? Miyad halacha kadosh brachu umalachay asherei v'yir miyahu lefanav. Right, so God, your miyahu, and the angels, they all start walking together. V'kivan shara'ah hakadosh brachu et beit hamikdash. Amar, when God saw the beit hamikdash, he said, "Bevadai, zehu beiti, v'zehu menuchati, shebau oivim ve'asu v'okir tsonam." Right, this is my house. This is what what the enemies did to my house. Right, at that moment, God was crying and saying, Woe to me for my house. Where are you, my Kwanim? Where are you, my children? Where are you, my beloved ones? What more can I do? He I warned you and you did not repent. Amar Hakadosh Barhuli Yermiyahu. God turned to Yermiyahu and said, Ani Dome Hayom, the Adam Shahayalo Ben Yechidi, the Asalo Chupa, Umate Betoch Chupato. God said, I today am like a man that had one child and I made for him a wedding canopy, and there he died, right? It's a very poignant description, and it really reverses the depiction of God. In Megillat Echa, in Echa Rabbah, God cries, God mourns, God is the one left with the empty wedding canopy. God is bereft of his Beit HaMikdash, he is bereft of his firstborn son, he is bereft of his future. And we have many, many depictions of God crying and mourning, becoming almost human-like in his pain. This makes Echaraba not a source of, uh, of, of God's alienation, but rather the exact opposite, right? God becomes uh, part of the Jewish people. It's another indication, I think, of Chazal's extraordinary creativity in really reversing the meaning 
of Echa. Um, it, it reminds me very much of, you know, Rashi was very, very um, involved in, in a similar kind of activity, and that is consoling his community during a time of terrible persecution, right? Rashi lived during the time of the Crusades, and Rashi uh, oftentimes in his book, in his parish, is <clears throat> trying to give the people strength to support them. So, for example, I think it's a pretty well-known thing that in the first Rashi on every book of the Chumash, Rashi opens with God's love for Am Yisrael. Right, did you ever notice that? The first Rashi of Barishi, the first Rashi of Shavuot, go back and check. First Rashi of Vayikra. But this is, this is Rashi's opening um, uh, uh, idea, okay? Now, also at the same time, going back to the burning bush story, right? So, you know, everything comes together. In the burning bush story, so there's a lot of discussion as to what is the metaphoric meaning of the burning bush, right? I mean, Midrashim go on and on. The bush is Mitzrayim and the fire is... Am Yisrael, and Am Yisrael is in the bush, and they're being ripped, and lots of different possible explanations. Rashi chooses one, right? Because he can't, he can't bring every single possible um, uh, explanation of what is the metaphoric meaning of the burning bush. You know which one Rashi chooses? Remember what Rashi says there? Good, excellent. Imo anochi bitzara. What's the burning bush? The bush is Mitzrayim, the fire is God. It's God that is trapped there in the thorns of Egypt. It's God that's suffering along with his nation. Imo anochi bitzara. That's what the Echarab is trying to tell us. If God is suffering with us, we are not alone. We have not been rejected. We have not been alienated by God. God is part of the story of Am Yisrael's suffering. Um, now, not only does God suffer alongside of Am Yisrael in Echa Rabbah, he also accompanies us into Galut, thereby ensuring that they are really not alone. That's what we have here in source number seven, right? Source number seven, the, the Midrash says as follows, Davar uh, Yirmiyahu Meit Hashem Leimor, Mayoto Davar Ela Sheamarlo, right? God speaks to Yirmiyahu. What was the thing that he said to Yirmiyahu? He said to him, Yirmiyahu, in ata yativ hacha, ana azil imhon. If you stay here, I will go with them. V'in ata azil imhon, ana yativ hacha. And if you decide to go with them into Galut, I'll stay here, right? We need, we need a leader in each, in each community, right? So there's a community that stays with Gedaliah ben Achikam in Israel, eventually makes its way to Mitzrayim, and then there's a community that goes to Babel. So God says to Yirmiyahu, let's figure it out. You go with one, and I'll go with the other. Amar lefanav, so Yirmiyahu said, Ribono shalolam, in ana azilam hom, ma ana yachom ahani lahom? Right, if I go with them, how can I help them? Right, they're the ones who are really suffering, the ones going down to Babel. El yezo malchahun, brehun imahon, dehav ayachom ahani lahom, sagi. You should go with them, because you can help them very much, right? And the implication of the Midrash is, is God goes down to Galut with the people. This is really, really different than the way that, um, that, that Echa represents the relationship between God and the community at this time. Of course, not only is God not accompanying them, but we can't find God in the book, right? He's really very distant. And th- as I said, <clears throat> that's not tenable for Chazal. And so Echa Rabbah really offers a very different portrait of God. But the other theological question that I, wanted to, uh, that I wanted to draw your attention to that I think Chazal are also dealing with is something we spoke about this morning, and that is the question of why. Why? Why now? Why so much? Why does all of this happen? Why in this generation? What have we done that's so bad, right? Now, you know, I answered the question this morning, right? We talked about the tochacha and we talked about the prophecies, right? But when you really look, when you're not looking at those linguistic illusions and you actually just look at the face of it, so Echa offers some kind of general sense of chet chata Yerushalayim, al kein lenida hayata, right? Yerushalayim sinned. They were bad. Sadiku Hashem ki fihu mariti, right? God is righteous. Right, I have rebelled against him. My yitonei adam chai giver al chataav. Right, it's it's because of sins, generally speaking. Right, oy nalanu ki chatanu. Every once in a while, we have a little bit of a reference to sins, but there's no real sense of what those sins are. Right, you know, there were the bad neviim and the bad koanim, which they're clearly sins of leaderships. But what do the people do wrong? Chet chatayu shalayim. 
So they, they sin, but what? It's missing. It's not enough. It's not developed enough. And Chazal are very, I think, concerned about <clears throat> this theological gap, this, uh, this, this void. They are afraid of leaving Echa with a terrible sense of unfairness, of Sadiq Varalo, of, of, of righteous people who bad things happen to them. And I think that that incomprehension is found really throughout the book of Echa, right? In other words, the Chet Chata Yerushalayim isn't enough because the people continuously turn to God and say, Re'ei Hashem v'habita l'mi olal tako. Look, God, and see to whom have you done this, right? In tochal nanashim piryam olalei tipochim. They're women eating their children. What did you do, God? Right? Haragta biyom apecha. Tavachta. Lo chamalta. You killed on the day of your anger. You slaughtered without compassion. Those echoes are very troubling. And they're troubling, I think, for us whenever we read Echa. But for Chazal, I think that this leaves a dangerous theological vacancy. Chazal do not want on any level there to be a sense that divine punishment here is either unwarranted or disproportionate at this time, or worse, of course, an indication that God has rejected his people. By the way, this is very important for Chazal, this question as to whether or not God has abandoned his people. Very important. Why? Chazal are dealing with something in Echa Rabbah that Echa was not dealing with. And what is that? Christianity. Absolutely, right? Christianity, which theologically is built on the second korban, right? So after the second korban, that's when Christianity developed. And, and their major idea was, was God abandoned his sinful nation and chose a new nation, right? So this is really very important uh, in Echa Rabbah. And you see it really, you know, um, uh, in all sorts of echoes that it is very important for Chazal, both to give a sense that God has not abandoned his people, that he's with them in Galut, that he has not chosen another nation, and also to make sure that everyone understands that all everything that's going on in Migilat Echa is deserved and justified punishment. Now again, I mean, it's similar a little bit to what I said this morning, which is that Chazal are going to spend a lot of time, a lot of time in Echa Rabah, cataloging the sins, right? Which, you know, as I said this morning, it doesn't really feel like a consolation, right? So you're reading through Echa Rabah and you're saying, another one, another one, right? So, you know, Kevan Shechatu Galu, right? You hear it over and over. Because they sinned, they were exiled. And on some level, it feels sometimes like we're just sort of heaping more and more abuse on this rather battered and maligned uh, nation. <clears throat> but I think that we have to understand it in a similar way that I was saying this morning, which is that the korban has to have meaning. It has to fit within a, 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 a theological framework. And for that to be understood, you know, linguistic allusions aside, when I read Echa Rabbah as a uh, person living in the third century, I want to understand what did the people do wrong that warranted exile from their land, that warranted the collapse of national autonomy. What could have been so bad? And so what we find throughout Echa Rabbah is, I would say, two sorts of ways of describing Am Yisrael's sins. One is, uh, you know, these very long, elaborate stories, which, you know, in great detail and at great length describe the sinfulness. So you have these stories where, for example, you have a, a, a story of, um, of, of idolatry in Jerusalem. It's a very elaborate story. And it tells the story of how they built this uh, house of idolatry in Gay Ben Hinnom, right? You all know where Gay Ben Hinnom is, right, Gehenna? Right? That's Gay Ben Enom. That's where they used to worship idols, right? So they build this, this building and it has seven mechitzot, right? The building, right? It's very, very detailed description. And um, each person that would bring a gift to the idol, the bigger the gift, the closer he would get to the idol. So if he brought, you know, a flower offering, they'd open one door and he'd get a little close to that. If he brought a bird offering, they'd open him two doors. 
If he brought a sheep, they'd open three doors. A goat would get four. An ox would get five. What's bigger than an ox? I don't know. You know, something bigger would get, would get six. And if they brought their child, they'd get to go in all seven. And they'd go into the inner sanctum. And then the, the, the Midrash goes into great detail describing the sacrifice of this child. And it's really very, very horrifying, as, as one can imagine, right? So they have a description of the child and the child crying and the, the priests in the idolatrous shrine playing their music. Why are they playing the music? Because they have to drown out the kids crying because they don't want the parent to regret it. So this whole description was just meant to give you a sense of what is taking place in your time, and particularly the way in which this whole story is sort of a parody, right? It, it, it mirrors and contrasts the Avodat Beit HaMikdash, right? Which also has deeper and inner sanctums, which also has certain rules as to how you go into the Kodesh Kodashi. But of course, <clears throat> obviously the rules are very different. So if, if, when you start reading these stories, you say to yourself, wow, that's a really vivid story. I'm there, I'm in it, I'm walking through it. Why are Chazal telling this story? They want you to be feeling how, um, how, how the atmosphere in Yerushalayim is so mired in sin, how much effort and how much detail is put into building this idolatrous shrine and how many people are willing to sacrifice their children. Right, so you know, there are other stories like that as well. There's a pretty well-known story, which uh, is in Echa Rabah, where um, the, the, the young women of the city um, uh, were, were engaged in all sorts of immoralities and Yermiao goes to them and says to them, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't be doing this, you know, God will bring the enemy. And they say, oh, God brings the enemy. We'll just go out and seduce the enemy. It's all going to be good, right? So that's their response to Yermiao. And then Yermiao, um, the enemy comes, and the women, I mean, th this is really in the Midrash. The women take their high-heeled shoes, and they cut off the heel, and they put in between the heel a, a chicken pouch filled with persimmon. You might ask why. It's apparently considered to be something seductive. And then they reattach <laughs> They reattach the heel again, right? I kid you not, this is the, this is the Midrash. They reattach the heel, and the women walk down the street, and they tap their heels, right? And all the men come flocking, and, and Yermiah turns to God and says to God, wait a second, I said they were going to be punished, and they said they're going to be rewarded, and their reward is happening. And God says, okay, you know, uh, um, I'm going to punish them, and then all sorts of horrible things happen. I, I won't get into all the gruesome details, but but the the idea is is that the midrashim do spend a great deal of time describing this sort of picture, this portrait of a society that is steeped in sin. Now, the 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 other way that we see this is just in the frequency with which Chazal describe not describe but mention the differences, the catalog of sins, right? So that you get the sense that. There's nothing out there that they could have done that they that they uh, you know that they didn't right. There's no sin out there that was left unsinned right. So, for example, I just made a, a, a list uh, you know just in uh, Eicha Rabbah Perak Aleph of which sins are mentioned there as sins that are responsible for the destruction. I'm going to read for you this list. This is just Eicha Rabbah Perak Aleph. Okay, why? What was happening in Yerushalayim? Why did all this happen? Well, idolatry. They didn't listen to prophets. They had no tzaddikim. They didn't do mitzvot. They didn't do good deeds. They didn't pay their teachers. I like that one, right? <laughs> they, they didn't pay their teachers properly. They left the Torah. They, uh, they, they spilled blood. They stopped bringing korbanot. They were cruel to the Gentiles. They took advantage of poor people. They didn't learn Torah. They did a chil Hashem, right? They, they, they violated um, the name of God. They impurified the Beit HaMikdash. They didn't keep Shabbat. They didn't keep Yom Kippur. They were filled with arrogance. They were false prophets. They denied the oneness of God. They denied the Ten Commandments. I'm not even halfway through. Okay, you gotta wait, right? They denied Chamisha Chum Torah. They stopped doing Brit Milah. They stopped believing in Brit Sinai. They engaged in Schadenfreude. In other words, they were happy when each other, when people had misfortune. They did not turn to God in repentance. They ate chametz on Pesach. They kept the guarantor of the poor person, etc., etc., etc. It goes. On and on, and of course, there is always the, me the mention of the perennial sins and the ones that sort of, you know, lurk in the background of our ability to function as a nation, Egel Zahav and the sin of the spies, that's always lurking there in the background. That also comes up 
And my personal favorite, which I'll admit is from Echarab Perak Bet, where uh, Rav Huna asks, Lama Kharev, why was it destroyed? Shahayu Misachakim Bakador Bishabbat. So tell my sons. Okay, so uh, they, they they like to play ball and chow. So that obviously, I mean, you know, I say I say it a little bit uh, as uh, in a comical way because again, you could sort of hear the rabbi standing up in the shul and saying, "Do you want to know why the Beit Hamikdash was destroyed?" But again, you know, uh, short, uh, leaving aside the sort of you know uh, uh, polemical uh, drushas in the shul, I think that there is a sense here that Chazal are providing at least a sense of answer. These events didn't happen in a vacuum, right? And it's not meant to malign the people, but rather, as we said this morning, to offer for them a theological con- uh, context. So and we've talked about Chazal's attempt to try to sort of give psychological support to the people, to restore for them their dignity, to remind them of who they are. We talked a little bit about how Chazal deal with some of the theological vacancies that are left behind by Megillat Echa, particularly the portrait of God and the question of why these events happened. And now I want to turn to the final topic, which, uh, which I want to address, and that is that in Echa Rabah, there is quite a bit of practical advice with regard to rehabilitation, how to move on, how to continue to live a full Jewish life in the wake of the loss of the Beit HaMikdash, not just the loss of the Beit HaMikdash, but what I was describing that we have in Echa in general, and that is the, the loss of communication with God. Right? Now something that I think, I, I didn't mention it before, but something that I think is particularly troubling is that twice in Parag Gimel, the Parag suggests, the Geger suggests that there's, that there's no recourse through tefillah because God's not listening. Right? Remember, he's not looking. There's a sense of the hyster panim. So the pasuk in Parag Gimel, pasuk Chet, tells us, Gam ki ezak va'ashavea satam tefilati. Even when I cry out and I plead, my prayer is cut off, right? And later on in the parak, sakota va'anala me'avor tefila. You clothed yourself with a cloud. You didn't allow prayer to penetrate. This is very troubling, right? And so Chazal, in reading that Pasuk, they actually, and they don't necessarily turn this one on its head, but look at what they say in source number eight. Right, Rabbi Chelbo, Sha'alit, Rabbi Shmuel, Bar Nachman, Amar Lo, Mipnei Sheshamati Alecha, Sheta Bal Agada, Ma'u Din Dichtiv, Sakota V'anan Lach Me'avor Tfila. Right, so Rabbi Chelbo turns to Rabbi Shmuel, Bar Nachman, he says, you gotta do something with this Pasuk, right? I know you're really good at it, so what are you gonna do with this Pasuk that says that we have no more recourse through prayer? Amar Lo, he said to him, Nimshalat Tfila Kemikva, V'nimshalat Tshuva Kayam. Right, Tfila is like a mikva. But tshuva is like a sea. Ma mikveze pa'amim p'tucha pa'amim ne'ula. Right? Sometimes, right now, you go to the mikveh, it's going to be locked, right? You can't get in. Kach sh'arei tefillah, pa'amim ne'ulim, pa'amim p'tuchim. Sometimes it's open, sometimes it's closed. Aval hayam hu le'olam patuach. Kach sh'arei teshuva le'olam p'tuchim. Rav Anan doesn't like that. He says, no, 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 tefillah is not closed either. But okay, that one reverses the meaning. But again, I think that this contains within it not just what we were saying before, which is the sort of creative reversal of the meaning of the passive, but even what I'm looking for, which is pragmatic advice. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here if we don't have tefillah? So what do we have? How do we, how do we find God again? And the answer that's given is, well, if you engage in self-introspection, in tshuva, that's always present, right? God may for the moment be angry and, and blocking the lines of communication, but tshuva is still there because tshuva comes from within you, right? So I think that these kinds of uh, midrashim are here, are, 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 are available in order to provide practical advice to the nation how to cope with the loss of some of the really precious aspects of Jewish life that seems to have been lost during the time of the Chorban, and, and that Echa also seems to have lost or seems to recognize as lost. Um, and the, the last point, and with this I'll really conclude the shiur, and perhaps uh, one of the most uh, uh, important points, I think, in, in uh, Echa Rabah is um, 
the, the, the importance of, uh, of learning Torah. The importance of learning Torah, I mentioned before that Am Yisrael, you could take away their, their houses, you can take away their prosperity, you can take away their autonomy, but you can't take away that which is mobile, right? You can take away the Davidic dynasty and you can take away the Beit HaMikdash, but you can't take away Torah Moshe, right? You can't take that away. And that keeps coming up throughout Echa Rabbah. It's a recurring theme, the uh, opportunity to continue to learn Torah in the diaspora gives the community purpose and dignity and the commitment that is required to maintain an eternal relationship with God, one that is not dependent upon any external spatial point. It is not dependent upon the Beit HaMikdash. And so I want to conclude with this final midrash for today's shiur. I think it's an extraordinary midrash, especially given that it was written in Echa Rabah, which is you know, before the 2,000 years of Galut. I think it's a, a, a uh, midrash that recognizes what the secret to Am Yisrael's survival in Galut, what it is going to be, uh, especially given the fact that Am Yisrael undergoes a very turbulent history in the Galut, one that could easily lend itself to losing uh, faith in God and strength as a community. And this midrash suggests both the fear that accompanies Chazal that we might lose our faith and the underlying secret for not losing our faith. Look at this midrash. I think it's a wonderful midrash. Look here in source number nine. Zot ashiv el libi al kein ochil. This is a Pasuk from Parak Gimel, Pasuk of Aleph. This I will restore to my heart, and therefore I will have hope. Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana B'Shem Rabbi Yochanan Amar. Mashal L'maha Davar Domeh. Well, what is this thing that I have that is going to ensure that I don't lose hope? It's a parable. L'maha Davar Domeh. What is this thing like? L'melech Shenasa Matrona. To a king who married a woman. V'katav lak tuva meruba. He gives her a very, very big tuva, right? The Amalan, he said to her, you know, in case of death, in case of divorce, you know, God forbid, I'm going to give you this amount of treasures. I'm going to give you this amount of big boxes, uh, big wardrobes. Eventually the king left. He didn't leave her, right? He just, he went to do what kings do in those days. He went on his travels. But he got delayed on these travels. No email, right? So, her neighbors came into her. And they were mocking her. And they said to her, your husband, your king, has left. And he has gone to a faraway land, and he is never coming home. Who's that? Who are we talking about here? Christianity, right? This is talking about Christianity, right? That's the underlying name. So I'll get to that in a minute. And she would cry. And she would groan. But when she would go into her house, and she would take out this wonderful marriage document that her husband had given her that showed his great fidelity, his great commitment to her. She would immediately become comforted. Liamim, after many years, Baha Melech, the king came, Amarla, and he said to her, Biti Anitamea, my beloved, I am amazed. Echim tantli kolotana shanim. How did you wait for me for all those years? Amralo, she said to him, Adoni Hamelech, il malei ketuva meruba shekatav devanatatali, kvar ibduni shchenotai. Were it not for the great ketuva that you gave me, my neighbors would already have caused me to lose hope. Now, we have the name Shal, right? Chazal don't always bring the name Shal. Look at the way that he frames the name Shal. Kach ovdei kochavim monim et Yisrael. I think the censor got a hold of this, right? So do the Christians mock Israel. Ve'omrim and they say that to them. Elohechem yistir fanav mikem. 
God hid his face from you. He took his presence away from you. He is never coming back. And they cry and they groan. And when they go into the into the Batei Knesiot and into the Beit Midrash and they open the Torah and they see the story of God's commitment and God's love and God's fidelity to his people, they are immediately comforted. Limachar, tomorrow, Sheyavo Kates Hageula. When the redemption will come, Omer lahem hakadosh baruch Yisrael, God will say to Am Yisrael, "Banai, ani tamehamichem, my my beloved, my children. I'm amazed by you. Hey, achim tantem li kol otana shanim. How did you wait for me for all those years? Vehein omrim lefanav, ribono shel olam, ilulei toratcha shenatat alanu, kvar ibdunu haumot." Were it not for the Torah that you gave us, the other nations would have already caused us to lose hope. Zot ashiv el libi al kein ochil. It is this that I place on my heart, and therefore I have hope. The ein zot ela Torah, and zot always refers to vizot Torah asher sam Moshe. And so we conclude with, with I think, a very uh, apt and 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 uh, and correct assessment of what it is that kept Am Yisrael a, a, a viable community, a thriving community, despite many years of persecutions and wanderings and exile and the loss of national autonomy and the destruction of their city and their community. And Chazal already recognized that this is the secret of Am Yisrael's success. This is one of the great, I think, moments that we have in Echa Rabah where we see how Chazal were able not just to comfort Am Yisrael, but to guide them in this next period of a very difficult journey that Am Yisrael was on in exile. And we close with a bracha that we should continue to learn Torah, but not just here in the, in the diaspora. The, today, I think we have many opportunities for learning Torah and, uh, and, and, and that God should uh, very soon come to us and say, what was your secret? And we can tell him, Vizot Torah. Thank you. <laughs>